This is our third build uh, Stand Up To Cancer special. I'm Kate Thornton, your host, and we are live from London with a very rowdy audience. Let me hear you. <laughs> and a very special guest. Put your hands together, raise the roof. It's Olympic gold medalist and TV presenter, Denise Lewis. <laughs> If you've got a question for Denise, then please tweet us at Build Series LDN. Or if you're watching us on Facebook, pop a comment underneath the video. We will get to as many of your questions as we possibly can. Uh, Denise, Denise Plus Bump, welcome. Plus bump. How are you? I'm feeling great. I'm feeling swell. In fact. You are swell. <laughs> this is baby number four. Can you believe it? I can. Yes. Well, if anybody can carry a baby at 45 years of age, it's you, my friend. <laughs> You are something else. No, I'm feeling good, and it's, it's great. Um, the whole family is excited about uh, the, the new arrival coming. Um, but yes, 45 and, and going again. Love it. Love it. Best of luck with it. Thank you. Uh, but you've still managed to find time to come in and fly the flag for Stand Up To Cancer. Um, it's a campaign you've been involved with for many years now. Yes, it is. And it's October. So we are championing and getting, trying to get as many people to get behind this wonderful initiative and charity. You know, Stand Up To Cancer is, is so important. Um, I've been involved. Um, so we're watching all the Build viewers. This is your call to action to get involved Absolutely. and do as much as you can to, to raise money. And the money that we raise goes to vital cancer research, uh, money that would never otherwise be there. There isn't, you know, this is not money that comes from the government. It's not match funded. This is money that we raise by doing a little. And if a lot of us do it, a whole lot gets done. And it helps um, to fight cancer and find treatments and hopefully one day some cures uh, for the one in two people that will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their life. That's, that's one in two of us. You've got a 50% chance of being diagnosed with cancer. So we need to make sure that the scientists that we rely on for breakthroughs in the labs are funded to the very best of their ability. And, and Denise, you, you have, your, like so many people, you have your own experiences of cancer, certainly within your family and your grandmother, who was a massive inspiration uh, to you as a child, um, was a nurse yes, on the she, NHS that's and, right. and was also um, a cancer victim. I think we can say that because ultimately she lost her fight with cancer back in 2005. Is that yeah, right? That's right. Um, she came over from Jamaica, um, desperate to be a nurse. She wanted to make a better life for herself. And, um, and this, was what, this is back when in the... This is back in the sort of the early... There early she is. Look at this. Your, your grandmother <laughs> in her grandmother. starched nurse's uniform. Yes. So this is back in the sort of the 60s. She'd um, come over wanting to make a better life for her, for her and her family. Um, nursing is always something that she wanted to do. And she came to the NHS and devoted her life to, to working there. So 40 years. 40 years in the NHS. At the same hospital. At the same hospital where she eventually, um, when she got diagnosed with breast cancer, she then ended up, you know, getting treated there, which was quite hard, quite uh -huh. hard for the nurses who, who looked after her. But also she was quite, quite a matriarchal figure within, you know, her department. Well, and she so was old school, right? She was old school. As you can see, uniform was pristine. She worked tirelessly to help others. And so it was very hard for her to then be, be that person, be that patient, and, um, and probably accept. It was very quick, very quick. Diagnosis. As it often is in, yeah. in these situations. Um, your grandmother responded to a, a kind of battle cry from the UK um, as one of the Commonwealth countries um, for workers to come to England to help support this brilliant new idea that was being rolled out, the National Health Service. We needed men and women to man the, the service and, and bring it to its, you know, to life, put it on its feet. And, and that's why she arrived in the UK um, at the request of the NHS. Of the NHS, of the country, Commonwealth, you know, people from the Commonwealth are very proud of their connection to the, the UK. And so for her, it was a chance to, to come over to do something really good, really positive, and lend her support and now also make a career for herself. Um, doing Which wouldn't have been a, otherwise available to her, maybe in Jamaica. Not in the same way. No. Not in the same way. And also, to, as you said, to build something, you know, from 
from really not, not much to... Well, from the, the ground up. From the ground up. She was there at the inception. So when you think about what she would have been um, working with on those wards, treating other people with cancer uh, back in the 1960s, it's really important for us to remember how far we've come and we've only got this far because of the money that's been raised by you guys. Yeah. You guys at home, you guys watching on the, in the palm of your hand, you in the audience here. So we need people like you to help people like her to help people like ultimately us. Yeah. One of these days. I think you, you've hit the nail on the head there. It's so important that people think, what can I do? You can do anything, you know. This is what Stand Up To Cancer is about. It's your opportunity to really knock cancer out of the park once and for all, you know. And the only way you can do that is through fundraising. And you don't have to do, you know, you don't have to walk and mar run a marathon. You can, if you want to, you can, but you can walk, you can game. You know, if you're into gaming, if you're into football, if you're into baking, there's Anything. so many things on the website that you can get involved with and and just do something. Play your part. Play your Play. part. It's one month. It's payback. This is time. It, it is. is time now. And I think as well, I mean, certainly in, in the position you're in right now, you're bringing a new life into the world. Um, we have a responsibility to make sure that our children have all of the benefits that we can bestow upon them by really putting some welly behind this fight against cancer, don't we? Yeah, we do. And as you keep saying it, it's, it's a fight that goes on. We've come a long way you know, from where someone like my grandmother's, even in the last you know, couple of decades, how far we've come, you know, you can beat this disease. Early detection, um, fundraising, the more we pump money into research, the more they will beat this cancer and this disease. And, and we all have our part to play, because as you said, it affects so many. We all know a mother, a father, a daughter, a teacher, someone in your community will be affected by the disease. And if you want to do something, this is the month to do it. Absolutely. We, I, I don't think you could walk 100 yards down a busy street and not encounter somebody who has been touched by cancer. Yeah. That's the sad fact of the matter. Absolutely. Um, so there's a lot that we can do. Let's, let's talk about the women and, and men, like your grandmother, who are frontline. They're administering that, that care and support to cancer patients. And you made a documentary not so long ago where you went back to the, ho uh, the, to the hospital where your grandmother had worked. And, and you worked firsthand with those doctors and nurses and spent time with cancer patients. Tell me about your experiences there, because it was pretty emotional, wasn't it? It was very emotional. I wasn't sure how I'd react and feel being in, back in that scenario, um, walking the corridors, um, not only that my, my grandmother worked in, but also being on the, the cancer ward and seeing so many people actually receiving their, their treatment. Um, it was a real eye-opener, uh, but the grace and dignity that everyone had on the ward was just incredible. There was one young woman there that was, you know, nine years living with cancer and still having and receiving her treatment, um, but still so very positive. But nine years living with cancer, and mm. that's, that's really the key here. You can you live can. with cancer. You can watch your children grow up. You can meet your grandchildren now because of the advances of yeah. research and science and medicine. Um, and that's what's so encouraging to see. That's right. And, and actually what I, I took from that, because I watched the documentary, um, was the sense of community that goes on in those, those chemo treatments um, where you've got somebody like that lady who'd been sat there for nine years in and out having her treatments. Mm. And then she welcomes in and supports um, new patients and shows them the ropes and shows they become the friends and they support each other. That's right, but also key to all of that is the nurses, the care. They're the first port of call as you walk into the ward. They eventually become your friend. You know, it's it's it was just something I, I hadn't experienced like that where, you know, the nurses are there, they're on call, um, they administer, they talk, they're your friends. They're, they're someone that you can draw on inspiration and strength from in your darkest moments. Um, and like you said, this woman that had been coming in and out of the hospital for nine years was there to just put her arm around the next person to come in and say, you'll be fine, you can beat this, you can, you can really get through this. And it's that shared experience. Tell me about the bell. 
Oh, the bell. So outside each of the ward, um, once you've gone through your cancer treatment, there is a bell as you exit the hospital. For the last time. For the last time. Yeah. And you get to ring that bell and it's so empowering. It's so empowering. And I, it's, it signifies... I, I, I found it very moving to watch. Oh, it took my breath away. It really did. You know, the journey that, you know, people go through. It's so hard. And that moment, that ringing of the bell signifying that, you know, you've reached, hopefully in a lot of cases, the end of the road for the treatment. And you can exit the hospital with new hope. And that is standing up to cancer. Yeah. That is sitting there week in, week out, receiving those treatments that, that devastate your body in so many ways. Yeah. Um, but enable you to carry on marching in that body into the next phase of your life. And I think that's, it's really important to remember that. There was the, the beautiful moment in your documentary where there's one woman who's very timid, very shy, and she said, I'm doing it today, I'm, I'm ringing my bell. And you watched her, suddenly she rose up, phoenix-like, didn't she? And just chimed that bell and three chimed. times. And it was, it was euphoric. Yes, was wonderful and, and for the other patients asking, well, what's, what's this about? So it was just a symbol of the, of the journey. And as you said, empowering and, and, you know, entering the next phase, next chapter for the friends and family. And hopefully shutting the door on cancer, saying, okay, you were there for a while, but you're gone now. And that's, that's where we want to get to, so that we can shut the door on cancer. Um, but going back to that hospital, as well as meeting the patients and seeing firsthand um, how that care and, and support is administered, there was a very personal journey for you. Your grandmother, uh, when she was diagnosed with breast cancer, begged not to be treated at the hospital in which she'd worked for 40 years. She said, it's too difficult. I know everybody. It's yeah. too close. But they said, sorry, you, we're taking care of you. Deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was such a... I think it's so difficult for her, as you said, she worked there, she knew the hospital inside out, she'd been there for 40 years, um, it became her life, it was a routine, she worked nights, um, she gave her everything, um, and I just think she, she just didn't want some of her juniors that, you know, she had nurtured and, and worked with and mentored to see her in a, in a, a, in a situation that she, she didn't want to be in. She was powerless, she felt powerless at the time. I remember she was very emotional. Um, and yeah, she, she held, she tried to hold her dignified self and tried to walk in every time. But I could see in the back of her mind that this was an excruciating thing for her to go through, particularly being back, going to her work and hospital Place at the same, yeah. yeah. But it's interesting, my, my aunt, who now lives in Switzerland, she also was diagnosed with um, breast cancer and she refused to give cancer a word, a title. You know, she called it the C word. The can, C word. I can she understand didn't do that. that, yeah. But it's, it's, this was my favourite aunt. She's my favourite aunt. You know, she, um, she was always the one that you go to. She always give you a little cheeky jokes, she, life and soul of every party. Um, she got diagnosed about eight years ago, and as I said, refused to give you know, cancer a name. But she went to the gym every single day. That was her way of dealing with it. Through the treatment, she was fortunate enough not to be so bedridden. She had her sick days, but through her chemo, she went, forced herself to go to the gym. And so, as a family, you see two extremes of how to deal with the disease and how you combat that and someone else who is actually just guns blazing, punching it out and just saying, no, I refuse to be taken down by this disease. And I think as a family that unites us and, and makes us feel stronger because a lot of people ask me, how do you actually cope um, in my work with, with breast cancer care? That's my charity. I've been an ambassador for 12 years. Um, how do you cope when another person that you meet has been affected by the, the disease? How do you cope when, you know, some of my school moms have been affected by the disease? But it's that human resilience that just comes to the fore when you are diagnosed that I find so admirable and empowering and it gives me the strength to be able to talk about it in such a positive way that you can do this and take every, each day as it comes. How is your aunt? 
My aunt is fighting fit. Yay! Still, still my crazy aunt. That's um, good to know. I was scared just, to ask. No, she's, she's doing brilliantly. She's been in remission. Um, and for her, it was just a chapter. It was a chapter in her life, but she was determined to move forward. She's a grandmother umpteen times, ah. um, and she looks amazing. She really does. The biggest thing for her was, was losing her hair. And I, I then had to remind her that her beauty shone from within, and she had to try and put this, this very significant thing for a lot of men and women. Mm, it is. That she can, she can move past that and let her beauty shine. And it still does. And it still does. How long has she been in remission now? It will be five years. That's fantastic. Five years. That's so really, I'm, that's I'm really delighted. Lovely to hear. And she's still going to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> and she's still yeah. going to the gym. Yeah, she is. Why not? Why Listen, not? Whatever works for you. That's exactly. all I say. And you, and you say that within the family, you've, you've seen two very different attitudes towards this illness. Um, you also, when you went back, met with the, the nurses who had cared for your grandmother. Mm. And that was a very powerful moment for you to be reunited and reconnected with those men and women that had shown her so much love and care and tenderness in those final days. Yeah, that was... Even now, just thinking about it, it, um, you know, it's lumping my throat because at that time when the family were, were, were um, alerted to the fact that my grandmother had, had um, breast cancer, we were in such a shock, such a shock. She was hardly ever sick. She was such a, a powerful, stoic woman. Um, but going back... And, and, and sorry, going, going to and from the hospital as we did when she was admi um, admitted, it was just like a blur. You know, I used to go in with my cap on. I, I didn't make eye contact with anyone because I was so hurt. Um, but these nurses would hold my hand, tell me everything was going to be okay, or, or talk to me about what the treatment entailed, and really guided me through. And so to go back after, oh my goodness, so many years to, to see them still working the NHS, still wanting to get, deliver that level of service and care and love to their patients and to be reunited with um, the nurses was just, it was powerful. Yeah. It well, was really powerful. There was one woman in particular that when you, you saw her, you literally, it took the breath out of, of yeah. you, didn't it? I saw you almost recoil and just burst into tears. Yeah. You because you can never you, say thank you enough, can you? You cannot. You can't. You can't say thank you enough for somebody, a virtual stranger, being there every single day just to give those kind words. And, and flailing that in their support. Yeah. Exactly. And, and the thing is, we are blessed, right? We live in a country where we have free health care. Yeah. And, and people like your grandmother upped their lives to come and support that and work it and bring it to what it is now. But it... Those, those men and women are determined and they'll do everything they can to help you, but we have to help them to help their patients. And that's why we need you out there fundraising um, to make sure that there's more people like Denise's aunt and less like her grandmother. Absolutely. That live to, to, to stick two fingers up to cancer. It is. It is. And you're wearing the T-shirt. Come on. Stand up. Stand up to cancer. You know, do, do what you can, you can swear at it, you can shout at it, you, you can do whatever you need to do. Um, to fight it, but I think there is such a determination. There's a, a big angry ball of, of determination against this illness, and we need to get out there and do everything that we can. Yeah, and it's so frustrating for families. Um, you know, you do feel powerless. I've spoken to so many families over the years that do feel powerless, but gain strength from um, the person affected within their family. But you can do something. And that's, that is the message from today. You, you know, can be a stand baker, up to cancer. a gamer, like you said, a sports person like Denise. You can do whatever you want. You can get, you know, spon get sponsored to do 50 roly polies. I don't care. Just do Just it. Just do it. Just do it. Just, as you said, it's your chance to physically say, well, I contributed. Yeah. Doesn't that matter how much you raise? Ten pounds, it ten pounds. It doesn't matter. You're right. It really doesn't matter. If a lot of us do a little, that goes a really long way. Yeah. Um, Denise, best of luck with baby number four. Baby I can't number four. Baby number four. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please do join me in saying a huge thanks to our guest today. It's Denise Lewis, everybody. <laughs> um, and 
stay tuned. Um, I'm going to be back with another Build Stand Up to Cancer special. Uh, throughout the month of October, we are going to be putting our paws up, talking ourselves hoarse, and making sure that every single one of you get behind us, as we say. You cancer. <laughs> Stand up to cancer. Thank you for watching. Thank <laughs> you.